Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Uzma Sayed, and today I'm going to be speaking to you about SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, the novel coronavirus. So the International Committee on Taxonomy named the novel virus SARS-CoV-2, and the disease that the virus causes is known as COVID-19. There's a lot of information to relate to you. As you know, it's rapidly evolving, and there's lots of information um, that's being relayed on a daily basis, and I'm gonna to try to get through all of it as quickly as possible, and there will be updates regularly. So a little bit of background on coronaviruses. Uh, coronaviruses generally belong to a family of viruses that affect mammals and birds, uh, causing respiratory illness. Um, it's a group of RNA viruses, and they cause a spectrum of, of illness. So you can have a mild respiratory illness, which is very common uh, for uh, these different strains of coronaviruses that we see seasonally usually, and then you can have more severe uh, syndrome that can present with uh, novel strains that emerge. So you may be more familiar uh, in previous years of illnesses, diseases such as SARS and MERS. SARS, for example, is in the same class of family as COVID-19, uh, um, uh, came about in 2003, where bats were known to be um, the originators of this virus, and there was an intermediate host known as the palm trivet. And then, you know, we saw that there was significant uh, mortality and disease from this. MERS, which was more recent in 2012, we saw really an overwhelming um, pneumonia being presented specifically um, in Saudi Arabia. And uh, it was found out that this was also a bat coronavirus and the camel was the reservoir. Um, it was then noted that there was uh, some human transmission and that's how those cases came about. Some brief background on coronaviruses. As I mentioned before, they're a group of viruses that cause respiratory illnesses, and they've been around for quite some time now. Um, the reason why it's called corona is because of its characteristic appearance. It has this crown-like appearance, um, and it has four different genera in this uh, group of viruses, the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. And the beta is really where we have seen MERS, SARS, and now COVID-19. Um, and because it belongs to the same family, the virus has been called SARS-CoV-2. And as I mentioned before, it's a single-stranded RNA genome, and it contains over 29,000 nucleotides, encoding for over 9,000 amino acids. What's also unique about this virus is that it has a specific glycoprotein on its envelope, and you see that characteristic appearance there. So initially, studies that were coming out of China in uh, December of 2019 um, showed that there was, you know, this virus that was um, novel and new uh, that was emerging out of there. So the very first reports in December 2019, and originally it was referred to as novel COV, um, we noticed that it had emerged in the Hubei province of China. And then we noticed that it spread rapidly in mainland China and other countries as well. It is a beta coronavirus, and as I mentioned before, it's related to bat SARS-like coronavirus. And because of the spikes and the ORF proteins, those are the things that differ on these viruses, and it gives you differences in pathogenicity and transmissibility. We can see that the structures of SARS-CoV-2 is similar to SARS as it binds to the same receptor, the angiotensin-converting enzyme 2, and which is necessary for cell entry. The mort mortality of SARS was higher. However, we don't have definitive data as of yet for what's going to be the final mortality with COVID-19 as we are in the midst of this global pandemic. Earlier on in December of 2019, um, as the novel coronavirus um, emerged out of China, there were some earlier studies that were reported that uh, were really looking at where this cluster of illness was originating from and where essentially this outbreak was happening. And it was pinpointed that it was happening in Wuhan. And what people noticed was that it was initially isolated from stallholders who worked at the South, um, the China seafood market in Wuhan. And really early on, actually, there were some studies that were done to look at the uh, phylogenetic um, uh, relationships between these isolates. So they had a study where they had 27 isolates of the 2019 NCoV, which is now called SARS-CoV-2. Um, and they found that from four different locations, all of these individuals had contact with people from Wuhan, and there were six different genotypes that were um, there in this. So SARS-CoV-2 um, is a zoonotic um, uh, virus. Uh, essentially, as I mentioned before, it was discovered uh, from a seafood market. And the thing that's unique about this is that in this seafood market, not only was there seafood and shellfish, but there was also livestock, there was poultry, there was bats, um, there's lots of different um, animals there. 
So we know it's a bat-derived uh, beta coronavirus. The intermediate host is a pangolin, um, which is actually one of the most trafficked animals in China. It's used for many different purposes, um, and some of it is medicinal as well, um, and most commonly affects mammals. We do know that there's two different strains that have emerged, and the L strain, which is responsible for 70% um, of the strains that we see is mostly seen in China and was seen very early on. And then the S strain was uh, seen in 30% of cases. More recently, we saw a phylogenetic analysis of the COVID-19 virus. Um, and you can see the close relationship with the other viruses in the, the coronavirus family. Looking at the clinical syndrome of illness that we see with um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, leading to COVID-19, there's a spectrum, as I mentioned before, but the most common symptoms that you are gonna see in majority of patients are respiratory symptoms such as fever and dry cough. It is important to note that there have been several cases of low grade temperatures, or in some cases, even patients that have been afebrile. But soon after, you know, the most common being fever and cough, um, you can also then progress, obviously, to more severe symptoms of shortness of breath. So constitutional symptoms are pretty common. The fever curves can be really varied. You can have prolonged fever curves, you can have intermittent. There's some, besides respiratory symptoms, you can um, sometimes see gastrointestinal symptoms as well. And earlier reports had um, reported that people were exhibiting uh, commonly episodes of nausea prior to the onset of fever. There were also a lot of reports of diarrhea that was reported in, in cases early on in China. Um, however, um, with the extended amount of cases that have been reported, uh, it doesn't seem like that's a, a common symptom. It still is less, light, less common uh, case scenario, and it hasn't really been proven if um, there is any transmission in that route. Pharyngitis can be present as well, and as well, you can see rare uh, symptoms of hemoptysis as well in some of these cases. The syndrome, uh, you know, really has a wide spectrum. You can have mild symptoms, which majority of cases we do see will have mild respiratory illness. And then you have 20% of cases um, which have worse outcome. And with increasing age, we see increasing um, outcomes, worse outcomes, as well as mortality. So patients can, you know, have acute kidney injury. Uh, they can go on to have, there have been some reports of meningoencephalitis. There's been severe respiratory illness that has progressed to ARDS. Um, and you can obviously see multi-organ failure leading to death, and there's been significant mortality globally from this disease. The median age has been really around 55, but what we do see is that although uh, the median age is 55, as I mentioned before, 80% of individuals um, will have good outcome and will recover and have mild illness, and 20%, those who are most susceptible, will have worse outcome, um, and those are the ones that we see higher mortality in. So about a third to a half of severe cases had these underlying medical conditions that I was referring to before. Underlying cardiovascular disease, um, lung disease, any type of immunosuppression puts patients at higher risk. Smoking was a, a clinical indicator uh, specifically for people in, um, in China, and they did find that there was a male predominance. Looking at incubation, prodrome, and infectivity, it really is a really large spectrum. So you can have a short incubation from one to two days and as long as up to 14 days. But the average incubation period is about five days. Majority of cases, as I mentioned before, um, uh, will be mild. However, the 20% that are progressing, you know, are going to have real severe illness. And a lot of these patients will be presenting to the hospital with their severity of symptoms. Patients that have mild symptoms can most likely resolve and recover after about two weeks. Um, the more severe the symptoms are, the longer that the recovery phase is, and it can be as long as six weeks in some patients. Based on the global WHO data, up to and including March 9th, the most recent data that we have, is that the doubling time for COVID-19 is as follows. Doubling time for global number of cases, including China, is approximately 19 days. Doubling time for global number of cases excluding China is about five days. Now, the fact that the doubling time is longer when China is included is due to the fact that the number of daily cases has declined after the lockdown that was seen in China. Now, transmission of this virus. This has evolved so much from the first reported cases in December till now. So it's, it's evolving. What we noticed initially was that the contacts were coming strictly from this 
seafood market in Wuhan. And essentially it was basically assumed and presumed that it was all source related. Well, soon after we had the first case of a spouse of a person who had traveled um, and had been in, in Wuhan who had then become ill with the virus. Um, and after that, we started noticing that there was obviously human to human trans transmission. And we noticed that this really revved up quite a bit in China specifically where there was familial clustering of cases. Um, so that really um, consolidated this, you know, um, effect that, you know, there was significant human to human uh, transmission that was happening. And soon after that, we saw that there was profound community spread. Um, and that's where we are today. Diagnostic modalities, um, and this has also evolved, you know, as I mentioned before, with any pandemic epidemic um, that's happening, you know, there's so much that's evolving on a day to day basis. So initially, when we first started following um, the virus and the disease, um, and it was primarily, you know, 90% and even 95% of the illnesses were restricted to mainland China. Um, we were sort of focusing on our history taking uh, to be tailored to travel history. And we can see now that so much of that has changed. You know, now that we have significant community spread and as we are in the middle of a pandemic, we now have shifted gears a little bit. And although we are still relying on good history taking um, and looking at travel history, but we know that, you know, we have other parameters to look at and we've had patients who have had no um, contact with known um, positive uh, COVID cases that have had symptoms and have tested positive as well. So history is key, um, physical examination, clinical spectrum, you know, in addition to the contact with travelers, contact with confirmed cases, um, you really want to look at how you're going to um, get to the diagnosis, you know, how you're going to diagnose these. So one of the ways that we diagnose the actually definitive diagnosis for COVID-19 um, is with RT-PCRs, and um, these are done with nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs. So before we're able to diagnose, you know, there are some other uh, diagnostic markers that can aid us in diagnosing this. Um, uh, there, some of these are lab markers. So oftentimes patients that present with disease, um, we have seen trends that there have been, there's been significant lymphopenia. We have seen elevated LFTs. We've seen elevated ESRs and CRPs. Initially, a lot of patients will have normal procalcitonins, but then with a severity of illness progresses and patients are oftentimes in ICU, uh, maybe even on a ventilator, we can see that these procalcitonins have risen. Um, we have seen increase in troponins um, and CPKs from the cardiomyopathy that we have been seeing from direct viral infection. And certainly, uh, we have seen significant radiologic findings, which has been useful in aiding the diagnosis of this. It's important to note that in China, when um, all of the volume uh, of cases was so abundant, um, that at one point they had actually stopped using RT-PCRs and just had started using radiologic um, diagnosis for confirmatory cases. And what was really interesting is that they had even um, stepped away from x-rays and just moved straight to CAT scans because they were more specific and they were finding uh, more significant findings and were able to diagnose people quicker that way. Um, serology is something that's being uh, worked on currently, um, is available uh, globally in certain countries um, and being worked on here. And as far as testing modalities, the RT-PCRs that are available initially were available through the CDC, um, and now they have been made available through local Department of Health, and uh, as well as local labs are soon going to be able to um, have the testing be readily available. Radiologic findings in COVID-19, the most common finding is peripheral ground glass infiltrates. And these are very common. You can see them on x-rays and CAT scans. These are from patients um, in Wuhan that were infected with COVID-19. And what's important to note also is the progression of the radiologic findings. So you can see from day zero um, to four to seven how these radiologic findings really change based on the clinical syndrome. So I mentioned before that the diagnostic modality is a RT-PCR, which is really um, collected with a nasopharyngeal and an oropharyngeal swab. That's a recommendation um, currently. Sputum induction um, is not recommended. Uh, it is considered to be um, high risk. You know, there's more risk of aerosolization. So, you know, our diagnostic mo modality is primarily nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swabs. So testing had become um, readily available through the CDC. On February 3rd, the CDC had actually um, authorized the release of all of these um, RT-PCR test kits to go out to various um, Department of Health 
um, so that uh, different centers would be equipped and, and ready to test for a, you know um, an influx of cases as people were preparing. Um, and although the test kits were there, they noticed that you know as they were testing people, uh, they ran into some problems with some uh, difficulties, uh, problems with one of the assays, and they were coming up with some inconclusive test results. And so unfortunately, the test kits had to be pulled. Um, and while they were working on fixing this issue, there was a little lag um, in diagnosing cases um, in the U.S. So what's happened is that, you know, actually local health departments, um, local states, you know, specifically in New York State, um, has encouraged to develop uh, for the FDA to approve its own testing modality where state health departments can uh, really expedite this. And now, hopefully at local testing levels, local labs, this will be more readily available as well. So some of the earlier studies from uh, China also showed that there was, you know, the RT-PCRs were positive, um, you know, not just on initial presentation, but, you know, they were found to be uh, positive later on uh, in patients' um, illness as well. So that really showed that, you know, that the more severe the illness was, that the more viremia there was in patients. Treatment modalities really, as we know, as we all know, um, for viruses, majority of this is going to be supportive therapy. Um, you know, counterintuitive to what we know in certain scenarios when people present in the healthcare system with severe uh, respiratory distress and um, progress to ARDS, um, a lot of times uh, the approach is to use steroids um, for these patients. One thing that's really important to note is that steroids have really not been beneficial. And in fact, they've shown worsening outcomes for patients with COVID-19. Um, and this was really showcased um, with the SARS um, epidemic. Um, and we learned this back then. Um, and what happens is that the steroids actually impair the clearance uh, of the virus, and it leads to longer, prolonged shedding and worse outcome. Uh, one of the drugs that is currently being um, tested in clinical trials right now is remdesivir, which is a, nuco a novel nucleoside analog. And this has um, some activity against related coronaviruses, has been uh, shown before in SARS and MERS. Um, and there's active clinical trials going on globally and also within the U.S. with this uh, novel drug. But basically, our, our, our treatment strategies are really aimed at um, infection control and supportive therapy of the patient and uh, contact tracing. So infection prevention, you know, um, I think this is something that's been uh, really reiterated a lot um, lately, and I think it's something that we can continue to use for educational purposes, um, educating the public, educating um, healthcare workers and friends and family and just the general public and children um, about uh, hand hygiene, um, you know, the proper ways of hand washing. I'm sure everybody's been hearing about the 22nd, uh, minimum 22nd rule, um, you know, hand sanitizer use uh, cough, proper cough etiquette, um, avoiding touching the face, disinfecting surfaces, um, that's very important even for the household. Um, really ways that we can um, prevent the virus from spreading further is what our focus should be um, based on. Triaging these patients is very important um, for infection control measures um, in a hospital setting. So with the history taking and with good measures, then we're going to move into um, how we can appropriately care for these patients quickly and not have it be a public health issue, which, you know, it currently is throughout the world. So isolation and infection control, um, the standard of care um, and the recommendations for COVID-19 is airborne and contact isolation for all suspected and confirmed cases. Um, so for patients that are coming in with uh, unexplained uh, respiratory illness, which is progressing and all of the workup essentially has been, and that requires hospitalization and all of the workup has been non-revealing and there's no alternate diagnosis, um, these patients, you really wanna consider COVID-19 um, as a potential um, diagnosis, even if there's no known exposure because of the significant community spread that we've been seeing. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, there are patients that they could have been exposed to that could be asymptomatic. Um, now, when can isolation be discontinued from a, you know, hospital um, scenario? Um, so basically, the patients have to be uh, clinically asymptomatic, afebrile, um, and they have to have two different specimens collected, the RT-PCRs, um, that have to be at least 24 hours um, apart, and both of those specimens have to be negative, and patient has to be asymptomatic before the isolation can be discontinued in a hospital setting. Uh, 
Um, it's known that you know droplets can survive on surfaces um, for days. We don't know specifically how many days um, SARS-CoV-2 um, lives on surfaces. A lot of this is dependent on uh, temperature and um, uh, the surfaces itself and the environment. Um, we are learning more and as we get more data, we'll have more information, but we do know generally that other viruses and similar families um, can survive for up to nine days. So really, um, you know, uh, end terminal cleaning is very, very important. So we wanna make sure that we're disinfecting all of the areas in the homes and as well as um, in the hospitals. So after a patient vacates a room, what needs to be done? You know, not only is there end terminal cleaning that needs to be done in that room, but what's really important for healthcare workers to know um, is that, you know, although the patient may have been uh, in the hospital, tested positive and then removed from isolation, whether they be discharged home or transferred to another room, it's really important that persons that are entering that room should still wear PPE, personal protective equipment, when they're entering that room um, until the area is thoroughly cleaned and um, aerated because of you know, the unknown of how long the virus could potentially be there. So what's interesting to look at is persons of interest. So the CDC had developed um, strict guidelines, distinctive guidelines for who they would consider persons of interest um, when dealing with SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. Now this was, uh, what's interesting about this was that about one month ago, the diagnostic criteria for this was that people had to have clinical features and epidemiologic risk. So clinical features of fever, respiratory symptoms, as well as any travel to Hubei province of China, any travel to mainland China, or any exposure to a person who had a confirmed case of COVID. 19. So what this meant was that the criteria was extremely strict. And so the people that were actually essentially meeting the criteria that would then get tested um, were, it was a very, very narrow um, spectrum of people. Now, fast forward to a month later, as I mentioned before, when you have a pandemic that's evolving, there is so much that's in flux. Everything is very fluid. There's new information coming literally on a minute to minute basis. So this is the current criteria from the CDC. And you can see that it's loosened up quite a bit where now that we know that there's significant community spread and there's clusters that people, they've really just left it up to the clinician uh, to say that if you have a high index of suspicion and you have no alternate diagnosis, then you know this person um, doesn't meet criteria for testing. And obviously, as testing becomes more readily available, that helps with um, the diagnostics of this. They had also come up with criteria, um, stratified criteria for um, uh, risk factors and how to manage them. And then for healthcare workers, what we're interested in is how to handle those that have significant exposure. So this was their criteria previously, and they stratified it by exposure category and you know what to do for those healthcare workers that potentially could have been exposed. Um, and what's interesting um, that I want to touch upon as well is that at some point, you know, um, although our protocol right now is airborne and um, airborne and contact isolation, as you know, that there is a large shortage of N95 masks within the country um, and globally as well, as well as the fact that, you know, not every hospital is equipped with uh, abundance of uh, airborne isolation rooms. So with the uh, expanding pandemic and with the potential to have more and more cases on a daily basis, there is a possibility that we will get to scenarios where we will run out, we will not, the hospitals will not have the capacity of isolating the patients in airborne as recommended, nor will the healthcare providers have N95 masks available. Um, and in these extreme scenarios, when resources are limited, um, you have to just move on to, you know, the next best um, scenario and next best practice, which is keeping them, you know, in individual rooms, doors closed, and using a regular mask when you have no other alternative. Now, if we look at the most recent um, guidelines from CDC for healthcare professional exposure, you can see that they stratified it further. Um, they actually categorized it into risk factors based on source control. So whether or not the person, uh, healthcare worker was in contact with a patient who is diagnosed with COVID-19, if that source was controlled with the use of a face mask. So then you have different criteria based on what PPE that individual healthcare worker was wearing, and then gives you the restrictions for if they need to be restricted from work, if they are considered high risk, medium risk, or low risk, and what the next you know, steps should be taken in addition to monitoring of the healthcare worker.
This is the same thing, but for um, no source control from the COVID-19 patient and the contact by the healthcare worker. Now, if we look at impacts globally, you know, if we're talking about epidemics and pandemics, you know, just looking at um, the situation report from the WHO from about a month ago, um, you can see that globally there were 46,997 cases, and majority of these were still um, confined to mainland China. And outside of China, there was only 447 cases. So WHO was really looking at epidemics versus pandemics in, in you know, the last several months. And in general, epidemic refers to an increase, an often sudden uh, increase in the number of cases of a disease above what is normally expected in that population and in that specific area. Pandemic refers to when an epidemic that has spread over several countries or continents usually affects a large number of people. So, we can see that a month ago, this is what the situation map looked like for COVID-19. And as of the 10th of March, we can see what the situation report looks like now. And this is from this morning, and I'm sure um, that this is, you know, there it has increased even further um, earlier this morning. You can see real-time reporting of the number of cases that we had globally, at over 121,000. Um, and you can see that the total um, deaths was 4,368. Total recovered was 66,216. And you can see here that we had, you know, the highest number of reported cases was in China, followed by Italy, Iran, Korea, Spain, France, Germany, and then you can see over a thousand cases in the US, which is, you know, these numbers are gonna to continue to go up. On January 30th, uh, the International Health Regulations Committee had declared COVID-19 a public health emergency of international concern. Again, looking at the newest data that's showing that you had significant number of cases of people affected all over the world, um, and you can see that it's rapidly evolving. So two days ago, um, the WHO had said that the threat of a pandemic has become very real. The director had mentioned that, Dr. Tedros. Um, however, they had declined to call it a pandemic at that time because they said, although a few countries were reporting large number of cases, there were 115 countries that had not reported any cases. There were 21 countries that had reported only one case, and five countries had reported cases that have not. Five countries had reported that cases had not been reported in the past 14 days. So that was just you know, about two days ago. And today, as you know, the WHO announced that COVID-19 is now officially being characterized as a pandemic. So the four key areas that the president wants to focus on of the WHO um, is that, you know, protect the people, detect, protect and treat, reduce transmission, innovate and learn. And I think that's something that we're really focusing on um, as a society. The more that we can educate people, whether it be healthcare professionals or the general public, the better outcome that we're going to see. Um, this just uh, graphic just depicts, you know, the um, uh, what's called the R naught, which is basically the infectivity um, of different viruses. And you can see for COVID-19, um, with contact after contact with one person who's infected, it looks like it's roughly about 2.5 people that can potentially catch the disease. Now, if you look at the case fatality ratios, the case fatality ratio is the share who died from the disease among individuals diagnosed with the disease. And here it shows you uh, briefly how it's calculated with the number of deaths from the disease divided by the number of diagnosed. What's interesting to know is that CFR, the case fatality ratio should not be calculated during an outbreak or an epidemic but it can, because it is still an evolution and you can really have a false um, representation of this. And that's very true for the United States since we are in the midst of this and we are just you know, entering our, our phase. So we really have to wait for more data, for more numbers to see what our number is gonna be. But globally, uh, the CFR is about 3.4%. Nationally, it's been reported about 2%, um, but obviously those cases, you know, in ages 70 to 79 um, had the worst mortality. And, um, and although it's reported as 2% nationally right now, um, uh, I think those numbers are expected to be lower as we're able to have more testing be done, meaning that we are, um, there's an underrepresentation of the number of people that actually have um, the illness currently because as I said before, majority of patients will have mild illness and will self-recover and, um, you know, will be difficult to diagnose. Um, fatality rate of those aged 80 years and older had, um, was about 14.8%. Um, no deaths were reported among mild and severe cases. 
and the fatality rate was about 49% amongst the most critical. So just as comparison, okay, in, and also in the latest China-based study, um, they found that men had a fatality rate of 2.8% versus 1.7% for women. So just to give you a brief um, uh, base of comparison, the case fatality rate of the seasonal flu in the United States is around 0.1 to 0.2% while the case fatality ratio for COVID-19 um, in the cited study was roughly about 2.3%, okay? So as I mentioned before, this number is still um, fluid. You know, we expect the number to be updated as we have more data. Again, this is showing you a, a graphic that depicts, you know, the fatality uh, from COVID-19 uh, based on Chinese studies and what we see there. Um, and as you can see clearly here, as age goes up, you know, there's an increase in mortality basically going up significantly after the age of 70. So where does that leave us now? Um, essentially, we are at the mitigation state. And what we wanna do is we wanna try to flatten this curve out as much as possible so that we can try to control this global pandemic. So as I mentioned before, the r naught indicates how contagious an infection is, and it's also known as a reproduction number. So it's roughly about 2.5. So what can we do to help mitigate this? Well, with social distancing, you can really reduce the transmission by roughly about 60%, which is what was seen in China, okay? Shortening the time of symptom onset to isolation is vital. Contact tracing early on is really gonna be important in trying to contain the spread. And these are the things that have been done elsewhere, and these are the practices that we have to look at doing um, within the United States as well. Household transmission rates are pretty high, three to 10%. So, you know, those are the things to keep in mind. And I think that's why contact tracing is very, very, very important. So early um, countermeasures are really important um, in an epidemic. And the intention is to lower the rate of infection so that that epidemic is really spread over time and the peak demand for the healthcare system ends up being lower. The mean interval of symptom onset between the primary and second case page within a cluster was 3.1, 3.1 days. And the mean interval of symptom onset between the primary and the last case patient within a cluster was approximately 3.6 days. Now with mitigation practices, continuous implementation of strict control measures, they had observed that a shortened span um, declining from three to one between illness onset and hospital visits occurred for these patients. And what they found was that this finding may result from strict infection control management, screening for suspected cases, monitoring for close contacts, and improved health consciousness of general population. You know, this is some really good data. And now where does that take us to now as far as treatment options? You know, we mentioned before the supportive therapy is really the standard of care since we have no FDA approved drugs currently that have been shown to have um, significant impact in halting the disease and treating it. We do have trials that are going on, as I mentioned before, remdesivir uh, looks promising and there's clinical trials going on in the US right now um, at the NIH and Nebraska. And uh, globally, as I mentioned before, there's many other um, trials that are going on with remdesivir. So we're waiting for some data on that. Um, lapinavir, vitonavir is another drug, Kalitra, which people um, know more commonly. It's a protease inhibitor and it blocks viral replication earlier. And this has shown some promise. However, we need more data. I mean, ultimately we need to have more studies, more data to show what's our best and most optimal approach in treating this and having good outcomes. There's been some studies that have come out with vitamin C, but they're really not strong enough data, not strong enough studies. So that's really not something that's uh, you know standard of care at this moment. Um, there's been some promising reports with chloroquine, and um, this had come out with a good amount of uh, data that you know had shown that chloroquine really has good outcomes um, in COVID-19, even more so than SARS. Chloroquine basically interferes with the ACE2 receptor, um, and I think that's why we were seeing some good results with that. So that might be something uh, worthwhile that is currently being studied. And as we have more data from um, the world and even within the US, I think we'll be able to make some better decisions for our standard of care. And finally, for those patients that are really, um, you know, uh, having severe symptoms who are uh, in severe respiratory distress, full-blown ARDS, 
in the ICU on the ventilator, what they're seeing is this intense cytokine storm. And how do we combat that? So one of the drugs that has been looked at that has been showing some promise is, you know, um, this interleukin-6 receptor antagonist, which is commonly used in rheumatoid arthritis. It's a DMAR, disease-modifying agent, um, and uh, tazolizumab. And that's, you know, the one that's been show shown to have some promise. So again, need more data, need more studies, but some of our interventions, in addition to treatment options, which are being studied currently, uh, we know that early intervention has been shown to have better outcomes in a lot of patients, and um, as well as early oxygenation has shown a lot of uh, good outcomes. Um, and, you know, treating, you know, supportive therapy, treating their end organ um, um, damages that are happening, acute kidney injury, how can we support that, supporting them in every which way, supporting their oxygenation, supporting their kidney function, anything that we can do to sort of um, help them along during this clinical uh, syndrome and spectrum of illness. These are the clinical trials with remdesivir that are going on globally. Um, we can see that within the U.S. we do have one active trial that's going on currently. Hospital preparedness. Um, you know, we're at the stage now in the United States where we've had many uh, number of cases and we expect these numbers to continue to rise on a daily basis. So how can we be prepared? What are the things that need to be done at this point? Um, so, you know, the most important thing is communication. Um, that should be the standard of care, um, the very first thing, anything that's happening needs to be communicated uh, throughout the entire hospital, health system, and within the community. I think a lot of the anxiety and a lot of the fears from an unknown, from a novel virus, um, can be from, you know, lack of information or uncertainty of the, you know, the quality and the caliber and the accuracy of the information. So communication should be the key for this and it should be focused on that. Um, you know, ideally you should have designated people that are in charge, that are taking the lead, that can then disperse that information out to, um, you know, uh, to the masses. You know, uh, establishing a task force is very important to really make your hospital be prepared and ready. Um, you should have, um, relay all the information to the healthcare workers. You should have proper PPEs in place, personal protective equipment. Um, if you have not done so already, then there should be proper training done of all of your your healthcare workers and staff um, to make sure that they know how to um, adequately um, don and off, put on and take off, you know, the uh, personal protective equipment. Um, fit testing should be done for the N95 masks that healthcare workers are going to be using for these patients that are going to be isolated um, and make sure that everybody is up to date on all of this. You should really also reinforce that once we have the confirmed cases, there has to be, um, you know, protocols in place for limit, limiting the amount of exposure. And that has to do with limiting the exposure to other people, such as visitors, um, as well as healthcare workers. So whether it be establishing telemedicine um, and different scenarios within the hospital and the outpatient setting, that's something that really should be done and should be focused on right now. Um, making sure that the ERs, emergency rooms, are equipped for the influx of patients that are going to be coming in. That's crucial right now. You know, if there is a large cluster of patients um, happening and an outbreak in a particular area, um, uh, the ERs should think about having a separate area for triaging these patients that are all coming in with fever and respiratory illnesses um, and making sure that their the areas are well aerated and then there's about six feet um, distance between patients and that these patients are quickly assessed and triaged and if they need to be admitted, um, then they are quickly uh, put into isolation and then um, further assessed, you know, uh, with the appropriate protocol. Uh, limiting visitors to the hospitals is very important right now, and I think, again, communication is key with this, developing uh, good practices for having uh, signage for uh, visitors to the hospital so that they know not to visit when they are ill, um, having questionnaires handed out to visitors, making sure people are checking in and making sure that there aren't unnecessary visitors um, to the hospital that are going to be affecting the most vulnerable population. Really, it's all about protecting those that are the most vulnerable um, at highest risk of having the most, the worst outcome in this. Um, so whether it be hospitals or nursing homes, we really have to focus um, on these people and this population. And really having good infection control practices in place and just you know, reiterating that and reviewing everything with the staff is really the goal at this point.
So finally, what's on the horizon? Um, I'm sure you've heard that the vaccine development is underway. Once the first patient actually was in the U.S., vaccine develop, was diagnosed in the U.S., the vaccine uh, development went underway at the NIH. Um, it has now um, been uh, placed into phase one clinical trial. Um, and although things are moving very rapidly, you know, vaccine development is still something that's a rather lengthy process. Um, it's not a simple thing that um, is developed, you know, within a few weeks and then is ready to go. There's a lot of um, trials that have to be done. They have to measure, you know, uh, risks and benefits. They have to see favorable outcomes with the vaccine. They have to look at adverse outcomes, adverse events, and make sure that it really is something safe that can be used for the public. Our strategies for containment, you know, whether or not there's going to be any travel restriction, again, for the most vulnerable populations, I think this is something that really has to be stressed. Um, these people, you know, uh, the elderly, the immunocompromised, people with underlying medical conditions um, really should avoid any non-essential travel. And this you're going to see is going to trickle down to the general public as well. If there's anything that's not pressing, because the issue that we're having with the disease is that there's so much um, there's so much transmission with mild symptoms uh, and people that are even asymptomatic that it becomes difficult in containment. Uh, whereas in other viruses that we've had, for example, SARS, um, usually it was easier to contain that virus because people had generally severe symptoms when they presented and, you know, that at that time they were most, you know, viremic and the incubation was different. Whereas with COVID-19, um, there's a spectrum for incubation and there's a spectrum for illness and majority of cases are mild and people may think that they just, you know, um, are not that sick and there's nothing, you know, um, going on with them or they have no symptoms and meanwhile they're actively transmitting the virus to other people and, you know, people that can be most vulnerable from this. Contact tracing is going to be really key in this, really aggressive contact tracing um, and some type of containment where people can self-monitor and really limit, um, you know, their activity and exposure to anybody else because, again, it's all about protecting those most vulnerable people, the most vulnerable population that is going to really have the worst outcome. Um, and obviously, even though uh, we know that 20% um, are not going to do well, and majority of this are elderly. You know that there's always going to be outliers. In addition to younger people, they may have underlying health conditions. You are always going to see, um, you can't say definitively that there's never going to be a case of a young, healthy person um, that is going to have mortality from COVID-19. That's not the case with influenza. That's not the case with swine flu. That's not the case with any other viruses that we've seen in the past. So, you know, there will always be cases. Um, and so we have to keep that in mind as well. As far as mitigation, you know, some practices such as social distancing will really help, um, you know, curtail this a little bit since we are expecting to see a lot more cases, um, especially for the most vulnerable populations, really social distancing should be happening on a regular basis right now. And then again, that's going to expand more to the general population as well. School closures we're seeing rapidly throughout the country in areas where there is a dense population um, of people who are infected. Um, there's, you know, uh, school closures that are happening. And we're, you know, seeing a lot of universities that have been shutting down and going to online teaching. And I think that's not a bad idea um, for a practice uh, for mitigation of this. And I think we are going to see more and more of this in the next several weeks, um, because, like I said, we are really in the midst of this, you know, um, uh, pandemic and for the U.S., you know, we're really in, in the crux of it right now. Events and large gatherings, um, you know, uh, that's something that really uh, should be avoided. Most conferences have already been canceled and any large gatherings, as you're seeing nationally, are really uh, coming to a halt. And I think temporarily, if this is something that needs to be done to really help with mitigation strategies because of the, the demand that can be there on the population, those are the, that are the most vulnerable, the risk that is to them, and also uh, the demand um, on the healthcare industry where uh, the healthcare industry may not be equipped to handle the volume of patients when we are already in the peak of, um, in the midst of flu season and the hospitals are already full with critically ill patients who are all on ventilators and the capacity is just not there. There's, there isn't an abundance of, of um, you know, ICU beds and isolation beds in hospitals. So how do we mitigate, how do we prevent it from escalating to that um, nationally? I think these are things that could really help. Telework is something that's being promoted from a lot of companies. Um, if anybody is able to work from home, that should really be um, encouraged from uh, companies. And then, you know, you've seen globally that other countries have gone on to um, scenarios such as quarantine, mandatory qu quarantining, because 
they've had, you know, this epidemic and it's, um, you know, you've seen in China, you've seen in Italy um, that they're trying to get a hold of this and uh, before it gets, you know, any worse. And, you know, these are the measures that they're taking. And, you know, um, there's a lot of, um, you know, different takes on that. And I think socially, you know, it's a very fine balance. And I think if socially the country and the public uh, can be socially responsible and work together and you know everyone can sort of work well together to come up with these mitigation uh, strategies then hopefully you know optimistically i'm hoping that we can avoid things of that nature um, for our country here so timeline wise you know only time will tell what's um, headed for us um, you know a lot of viruses you know novel viruses come and then uh, you know they sort of um, dissipate over several months we'll have to wait and see we're still a little bit um, early in the game for the United States um, and only time will tell um, what's going to happen next thank you so much <laughs>